This is the first video I've made since my subscriber count suddenly skyrocketed, so very briefly I want to thank all my new subscribers for their kind words and excellent feedback on my last video, and also thank Shadowversity's Shad for being single-handedly responsible for giving that video the attention it got. I know the hopes and expectations of my new subscribers have given me a lot to live up to, so I figured it would be fitting to start off this new era for my channel with a video that was directly inspired by a suggestion made by one of the subscribers in question. This video is also a bit longer than my others, but hey, I've got a story to tell. These days it seems everybody likes Vikings. Games, TV shows, everything. Pagans with axes and ferocious battle cries, it's not hard to see why people are obsessed with them. However, do you mind if I prefer my Vikings Christian and armed with lances and expertise in Latin? Well, let me explain. Christianization of Scandinavia took quite a while, but long before that was completed, Christian Vikings were already making their mark on Europe. They created the English language as we know it, took long beards out of fashion and helped conquer Jerusalem. Yes, the Vikings I'm talking about are, in fact, Normans. So I'm going to talk about the Norman conquest of England, right? Wrong. I'm talking about the Normans that history forgot, because it seems that popular knowledge of Normans is more or less restricted to William the Bastard, 1066, Bayo Tapestry, claiming the English throne, landing at Hastings, English shield wall, rout, rally, charge, death of Harold, victory, William, I've got a new epithet, the conqueror. No, this is not about those Normans. This is about the Normans that moved south. William the Conqueror may have been a bastard, but he was his father's only son, so could still inherit the Duchy of Normandy. Other Norman nobles were not so lucky, because unlike most of Europe at the time, where inheritances were divided between all sons, the Normans typically only gave their eldest son an inheritance. Imagine then that you were the second or third son of a Norman landowner. You're wealthy, you're probably trained at arms as a child, but you stand to inherit no land. What do you do? Italy, apparently. Many younger sons of Normans became mercenaries, and as mercenaries do, they found making money easiest in areas that were a chaotic mess at the time, and that mess was Italy, specifically southern Italy. Ever since Charlemagne took out the kingdom of the Lombards in Pavia, the Lombard principalities of southern Italy had continued to exist, fiefs without a lord. They went from two to five and fought each other incessantly. To add some spice to this mix, there were also Byzantine holdouts on the coast, and Sicily had long been ruled by its own emirate, which had also established outposts on the mainland. There were also the really peculiar Judicati of Sardinia, but those aren't relevant to this story. Just wanted to mention them because they were so odd that I can't help but suspect I'll make a video on them someday, and because they are strictly speaking in southern Italy. Anyway, the story of the Normans in Italy all began in the year 999, when a band of Normans returning from a pilgrimage to Jerusalem came across the city of Salerno, which was being besieged by the Sicilian emir at the time. The Normans helped the Lombard prince of Salerno to break the siege, and the prince then offered them good money to convince fellow Normans to come to Italy and serve in his armies. I don't suppose he could have known this decision would destroy Italy as he knew it, because Normans did come, in increasingly large numbers. They made good money serving as mercenaries to Lombard lords for three decades, but then they were hired by Sergius IV, ruler of Naples, who was technically a vassal of the Byzantine emperor, but de facto an independent ruler. The Normans served Sergius rather well, it seems, and so he gave them a bit of land for their efforts, in Aversa, just north of Naples. Now that there was Norman land in Italy, even more Normans flocked to the place. Among them, four brothers from a family that would put their stamp on history, the de Hauteville, William Ironarm, Drogo, Robert Guiscard and Roger Bosso. The first brother that played his part in turning southern Italy upside down was William Ironarm. He was serving the Prince of Salerno when he and his men moved to support a Lombard revolt in Byzantine territory. This Lombard rebellion soon fizzled out, but the Normans kept up the fight, and William decisively defeated the Byzantines not once, not twice, but three times within the same year. And after that point, the region of Apulia was basically his to keep, albeit in nominal suzerainty to Salerno. Next up is Drogo, the brother with the best name, who managed to get on the good side of Henry III, the Holy Roman Emperor at the time. This was at a time when the Pope and the Holy Roman Emperor were vying for influence in Italy, which, as it happens, might as well be the subtitle for all of medieval and Italian history. And Henry III gave Drogo the authority to attack the Lombard Principality of Benevento. Drogo did, and conquered basically every part of it except the city of Benevento itself. This upset the Pope somewhat. Drogo then continued his conquest in Calabria, and by doing so upset the Byzantines somewhat. So much so, in fact, that they had him assassinated. Before his death, Drogo had appointed his brother Robert Giscard to garrison Calabria, but before we can get to Giscard's chapter in this story of brothers, we must talk about another brother, Humphrey. Humphrey didn't leave as big of a mark as the other members of the family, but he did inherit a situation in which the Normans were now in control of most of southern Italy, but also universally hated by all their neighbours. They'd upset the Byzantines, they'd upset the remaining Lombard princes, and most of all, they'd upset the Pope. Unlike today, upsetting popes in the 11th century was a recipe for instant warfare, and indeed, Pope Leo IX raised an army against the Normans. 
Humphrey did what Normans do and decisively beat the Lombardo Papal Coalition at the Battle of Civitella del Fortore, before capping off his achievements by kicking the Byzantines out of Lecce, the last stronghold in the heel of Italy. Humphrey died and Robert Guiscard took over from him. Guiscard was a clever man and went to Rome to officially ally himself with the Pope rather than fight against the papacy as Drogo and Humphrey had. The Pope was only too happy to have the now all-powerful Normans at his side rather than against him and in gratitude raised Guiscard to the title of Duke of Apulia and Calabria and freed him of his suzerainty to the Principality of Salerno. This brings us to the 1060s and a point where we briefly detour into the chapter of another de Hauteville brother, Roger Bosso. We'll come back to Giscard, I promise. Roger crossed from the Reggio di Calabria to the Sicilian city of Messina in 1061 in an attempt to conquer Sicily from the emirate that had held the island for more than two centuries. Of course, the emirate of Sicily had seen the power of the Normans grow over time and could probably guess they'd have their turn eventually, so they had amassed their armies in Messina to keep this from happening. In 1061, however, the island was divided over a power struggle within the emirate, drawing forces away from Messina. Roger was still outnumbered though and so he made his crossing in the middle of the night, surprised the emirate's forces completely and obliterated the army of Messina without having to even properly do battle with it. Gradually Roger would increase his hold on Sicily, taking Palermo in 1071, Catania in 1081 and Siracusa in 1085. This left Roger in complete control of Sicily but because Normans never seemed to know how to stop, he figured he'd invade Malta as well, adding another island to his domain and making the Normans lord and master of the central Mediterranean. Back to Robert Giscard now. Conquering Apulia and Calabria is nice, conquering Sicily and Malta is nicer, but it's nicest of all to conquer the big neighbour across the sea, Byzantium. Now keen historians among my viewers will know that Giscard did not in fact conquer the Byzantine Empire in the late 11th century and it would stay in existence for a little while longer, but damn he got close, and the Byzantines had to pull out all the stops to keep Giscard out. In all fairness, the Byzantine Empire was not as strong or powerful as it used to be when Giscard attacked it. Ever since the Battle of Manzikert in 1073, Byzantine Anatolia had gradually been taken over by Turkish fiefdoms. There was massive internal strife in Constantinople, and both the Cumans and Pechenegs were raiding the Empire's Balkan possessions at will. Timing was very much on Giscard's side then. If there was ever a point at which Byzantium could be conquered, this was it. He assembled a vast Norman army, sailed it across the Adriatic and laid siege to Durazzo. In the time it took him to do this, aforementioned Byzantine court intrigues had played out quite a bit, and Nikephoros Botaniates had abdicated as emperor and been replaced by Alexios Komnenos. Giscard had had a casus belli to attack Nikephoros, albeit a very flimsy one, but he had no reason to quarrel with Alexios. This was the first of his problems. The second, much bigger, was that Alexios had managed to scramble an army together against all odds, and was coming to relieve the siege of Durazzo. Normans do what Normans do, however, and Giscard solved these problems by absolutely crushing the Byzantine army. The elite Varangian guard was wiped out, the cavalry of the Imperial Tagmata were, and even Alexios himself was nearly killed or captured, suffering wounds to his legs and forehead trying to get away from the Normans. The Ratsa now surrendered to Giscard and he moved further inland to Castoria, expecting to be able to roll up the Byzantine Empire after his decisive victory. While Alexios had lost in military might, he still had in sheer money however, and so he bribed Henry IV, who had succeeded his father, Henry III, as Holy Roman Emperor, to invade Italy. Giscard went back to Italy with two-thirds of his army and all the money captured from Alexios, leaving command to his son Bohemond. Bohemond was an exceptional tactician like his father, but there's only so much you can do with a small army and no money. Capturing Larissa and wintering there seemed like a sound idea because it would give the Normans control over the strategically important region of Thessaly, and so cut off the land route from Thrace to Attica and Maria, effectively cutting the empire in two. Bohemond got so close to achieving this despite desperate attempts by Alexios to stop him. Two more times Alexios sent an army and both times Bohemond defeated it despite his inferior numbers. In the end it was only by bribing some of the Normans who hadn't been paid since Giscard left to Italy with all the money and some light illusionism that Alexios finally managed to defeat Bohemond. Bohemond was forced to withdraw to the west and leave behind all his conquests. In the meantime Giscard had dealt with the Holy Roman Emperor in Italy and was coming back to Epirus to finish the job, only to find he'd have to start again. He never got the chance though because disease took his life while he was preparing a new assault. That was the story of the four great de Hauteville brothers then, but what became of their successors? Well, like their Viking ancestors, they sought their fortune overseas. Bohemond took part in the First Crusade, now fighting alongside Alexios, and he'd be crucial to the success of that crusade. If it wasn't for the battle-hard Normans and the Bohemond's command and his own skills in tactics and military organisation, the First Crusade might well have been defeated at the Battle of Dorylaeum or succumbed to hunger and thirst under the Anatolian sun. In the end, Bohemond would come to rule the Principality of Antioch, creating yet another Norman state, but this time in the Middle East. Roger's son, helpfully also called Roger, never went on crusade but he too expanded the borders of Christendom. His conquest didn't outlast him but for a while at least he was king of Africa. 
When the Zirid dynasty started to crumble, Roger II saw his chance and invaded, taking Mardia first and eventually ruling the entire coast between Bajaya in the west and Tripoli in the east. When you hear about the exploits of the Normans of Apulia, going from a handful of mercenaries to the masters of Italy and near successors to the illustrious descendants of the Roman Empire itself, it does make you wonder why it's the Norman conquest of England that always gets all the attention. If you like this video, feel free to subscribe to Robert Explains, and if you hated it, feel equally free to spew vitriol at your leisure. Until next time.